just real sad of you. Life gave me a dream. And I dreamt of a door. And I had a door that was like like um, a crack and gold and light. It was shining bright. And I said in my dream, I said, what is this? And he said, it's the door of hope. So the next morning I got up and I looked it up in Hosea chapter 2, 15. And I, it tells about the door of hope. But he didn't say this, I'm going to sue it. God has brought terrible trouble on Israel. That's what they're disappointed in. They think that God is going to hurt them. That these God has hurt nations, and they also have delved into the economy of other nations, which God told them not to do. So He brought this trouble upon them. So uh, I studied a bit more. I studied a bit more and found that the Valley of Acre represented terrible types of trouble, overwhelming trouble. And uh, it was in the desert, which was the bitterness of one's soul because it had no hope. No hope at all. God has destroyed your hope, but he said, if you repent, I'll set up a door of hope. He did. He, he, he had Hosea marry a whore and uh, have children to her just to bring this point of God, how bad he wanted this. So uh, with that, on the Wednesday night following, Kathy said, God has told me to invite Doris and Linda for supper. And I said, okay. And she said, I was going to invite someone else, but God said, no, just those two. So you are. So they came and had supper with us. And after supper, Doris mentioned that she had seen a golden key in prayer, in vision. And, of course, we chatted about it. And then Linda said that God had told her to begin intercessory prayer more frequent in the church. And what we devised from all this, well, let me also say this. At this point, Doris spoke in tongues, as Linda finished telling us about the story she told us. And Linda was going to touch her on the arm so she could bring forth the prophecy, but God told her to touch Kathy. And Kathy brought forth that can't put new wine in old wineskins. And uh, it's time to move out of the old into the new. And he showed her a door. And we talked about it, and uh, we really didn't come up to any really solid foundation for what we heard, but um, it, it laid on my mind. And then it just dawned on me, I had seen this door of hope in my dream. And I said, I know what it is. It's a door of hope. So we were all quite happy about that. We, we did all that. So after the ladies left and went home, I decided to uh, study some more in the middle of the night. Because <laughs> God got me up. And he said, uh, this church is the door of hope. He said, the people of this church are the key to the door. And intercessory prayer is needed to empower the people to do what I want them to do. He said, I've made you fishers of men. He said, you don't see the lost pounding on the door to get in. You have to go and get them. And he said, been fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Ask your net on the right side. What that means is if it isn't working where you're fishing, go to another spot. 
And he wants us to go out to the line in great faith. This is what he told me. We have to start going out and talking to them. Tell them how God gave us hope. Because they have none. Their souls are dark because there's no light left in them. They don't know which way to turn. They're committing suicide. They, uh, they've tried drugs. They've tried sex. They've tried booze. They've tried a cult. They've tried everything. But it's time to tell them how to try Jesus. And this is what Jesus wants from this church, is to go out on the street and talk to people. Tell them your story. Because we all have been there. Or they have. I have. My, I've been so, so dark in my soul that I had no hope of ever getting out. But Jesus came to me. And if he can give me light, he can give them light. So with that, I'll give it back to Mr. Ryan. That was, yeah. And that's a throne room message right there. That's God speaking to us. Um, I hadn't got together with Paul. I just said, what do you got? Bring. Bring. Because I think God is about to move. We talk about God about to moving, about to move. Well, how are you moving? He's already done his part. We've got a part. Amen? And so this is what my, <laughs> let me give you the headline for today's message. And I'll quickly go through it because I'm aware of the time. I sure is message of hope. Like I didn't get together with him. I, did, I, I just knew the details, a few details of what, what Paul was, he was, they were really excited, and I was like, okay, that's, that's bring it. Um, that's God speaking to us. I'm reminded about three, four weeks ago, Pastor Karen, she brought a message about hope. And uh, remember the words uh, that uh, God spoke to her. He said, I'm forging a new road. Can you remember that? He said, I'm forging a new road. In other words, I'm opening up that door, you golden keys. And he also said this, and I can remember this. He says, are you willing to take this new path? Are we willing to take the path? I am. And that one of the things I remembered about it was that we were embers of hope. Remember that? Can you remember that? So if you take the hope that the Lord just spoke to them a couple of weeks ago, and, and he's been telling this three or four weeks ago before we left, that we are embers of hope. And he also said this, fan into flame those embers. Have you been fanning your embers? We need to start doing this stuff, amen? So I asked the Lord, what is hope? What in the world is hope anyway? And why are we to be embers of hope? Well, he showed me that there's three different types of worldly hope. Three different types of worldly hope. I hope Daddy gets home early tonight so that we can play ball before supper. That is called desired hope. I desire Daddy to get home early so we can have some time together. So the desired hope. Or there's our hope is that Jim will arrive safely. I hope Jim arrives safely. That's, in other words, Jim's safety is the object of our hope. And then the third one was a good tailwind is our only hope of arriving on time. In other words, the tailwind is the reason we may achieve the future good that we desire. It's our only hope. Well, those are the three hopes that the world offers. But the hope that Jesus offers is a way different than that. It's called assured hope. You can go to the bank with this. It's assured hope. I looked that word up this morning when I was sitting there. I was thinking, okay, Lord, what does assured mean? 
It means absolutely. It means directly. And it means without doubt. We have an assured hope that was given to us from Jesus when we received him. So this morning, what's it say? God is preparing us. He is preparing us in these days to be the assured hope of people out there. They have none. Paul just, I mean, he's bang on. They've tried everything. They tried desire and hope. They tried reason. They can't find it. But the assured hope is the only way. Amen? God has been speaking to us, ver various people in this church, through prophetic voice. We're prophetic people. We believe in the prophetic. Amen? But remember, prophecy is only in part. Like God can speak to us every week. But unless we take the reins and do something with it, he's done his part. If you do this, I'll do this. That's really what God says. And you know something? I, I put this down there. I believe that when we realize the assured hope that we carry in the name of Jesus, God will begin to show us where we need to activate it in a world that has no hope. Amen? So let me show you just a few things about this assured hope. This is awesome that we carry. I'll do it really quick. If we, the church, can grasp this, we can change someone else's life. If we can absolutely grasp what we carry, we can change somebody's life. And that's the only way we're going to do it. But again, we got to go out and do it. Amen? The Lord said we will be beacons of hope. That's a heavy, heavy responsibility that he says. You're going to be a beacon of hope to somebody out there. First, our assured hope moves us forward. We just heard, you can't put wine in an old wineskin. You've got to move forward. We have a realistic expectation and joyful longing for the future. Well, the world's going down. You know, hey, big grin on my face. I've got the future. And it's based on the reliable word of God. Amen? The more we long for the future, the less we will yearn for the past. Well, it doesn't look very good. The world's going down. The world's not going down. By the way, this stuff's all been written. I was talking to a guy the other day, and they were talking about persecution. Well, I'll get to it, the persecution, a little later on. And we're not persecuted. You want to go back into the Roman days, and you want to taste a little persecution. <laughs> we serve a moving God, folks. He's not back there. Assured hope increases our momentum. The next is our hope energizes the present. It's worth living today because eternal tomorrow is so much brighter. Many out there don't even see a tomorrow. And we need to demonstrate that there is through Jesus. Amen? There is a big tomorrow. Our hope enlightens our darkness. God tells us that in Isaiah 42, 16, this is a wonderful, wonderful scripture. Look at it. I will lead the blind by the ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will, I will return the darkness into, I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough place smooth. These things I will do, and I will not forsake them. That's our God. That's a, that's a guarantee. Yeah. That's pretty good assured hope in my book. Right there. 
you know, this hope increases my faith. Faith fuels hope. And hope fuels faith. In Hebrews 11, it's very clear that hope and faith are closely tied together. One working with the other. I'm going to say this. The greatest believers are the greatest hopers. And vice versa. They are. The greatest believers are the greatest hopers. Because they have that assured hope from the Lord. How great is your belief today? And this assured hope is infectious. It's infectious. You know, I, I keep looking at those Christians, like, and I know them, and they walk around like somebody shot their dog. And you look at them, and you, you actually cross the street because you don't want to run into them. Oh, please, don't let me run into him. I'll hear about all the things that are going wrong in their life. And that's a Christian. You know, you can drag people down by your moping. You really can. We can expire and motivate someone who is suffering from the world's impact. You got to be bubbly, folks. I've got assured hope. That's why I've got a grin on my face from time to time. They can't help but ask, why are you so happy? That's the greatest introduction right there. How come you're so happy, Trish? All this stuff's going on in the world, and you got a big grin on your face. I got a sure hope, my friend. Yeah, she's got it. She's got Jerry. <laughs> but look at First Peter, First Peter three fifteen. It says, "But in your hearts, reverse, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared." Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Always have, that, always have an answer. Wow, our answer is Jesus. If you don't know that, write it down. Why do you have hope, Cindy? Jesus. Enough said. Jesus, you can have the same thing. You know, this hope heals. Our hope has healing. To the depressed person, that disease is a sense of hopelessness. The town's full of these people that have this disease. And we carry the healing hope that there is a way out. There is a way out. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That step of hope right there is huge towards healing. And we got a town full of people like this that need Jesus. Amen? I love what Paul said. I mean, I could have just went over and sat down. Our hope is practical. Our assured hope is practical. It doesn't mean we just sit around and wait. Have you ever seen people like that? God said it, so I'm just going to hang out here until he does it. You'll be gray and old before you get <laughs> We have a part to play. Not at all. Hope motivates action. It really does. When we po hope for better days for our church, we serve. When we hope for our children to receive Christ, we share the gospel. Amen? Hope produces action. That's what it does. And then... This assured hope purifies. There's another one. It purifies. This is what inspired and motivates the apostle to persevere to the end and persevere in holiness. Look at 1 John 3, 2 and 3. It says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be 
has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purifies themselves, just as he is pure. This is a purifying hope that we've got. I want to be like him. I want it when I want to be when Jesus shows up and I'm standing next to him. You guys can say there's twins over there. Amen. Who wouldn't want that? Thank you, Lord. Our hope stabilizes us through the storms of life. You're going to have storms in life. You're not going to get around them, but you have that assured hope that you're not camping out there. You're just going through it. Listen, back in the old days, and I talk about, this is, this is the part where I talk about persecution. The catacombs, have you ever heard of them? Okay, they were caves and tunnels that persecuted Christians used to hide in during the Roman persecution. Thank the Lord we're not hiding in caves here. And they say that there were 66 drawings of anchors on the walls of those tunnels. Hope was their anchor during those dark and stormy days. Hebrews 6.19, this is what it says. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. They had that. They knew it. Amen. We wouldn't be here without them. But they had that assured hope. Storms of life are going to come. But we still have this assured hope in God. Amen. As an anchor. How's your anchor? How's your anchor, Kim? Is it secure? Thank you, Lord. And as one Puritan put it this way, he says, the cable of faith casts out the anchor of hope and lays hold of the steadfast rock of God's promises. I like that. I like that. And finally, the last one, this assured hope defends. It defends. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Ephesians six seventeen, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Why a helmet? Why a helmet? Because it protects the most vulnerable part of us. Right here, our minds. And our thoughts. That's why a helmet. Amen? And that's where Satan usually tries to attack us. Did God really say, you won't, you won't surely die? <laughs> that's where he loves to attack us. Amen? But I have an assured hope. This is what we carry to the lost world, folks. This is what we carry. And I believe through the prophetic word that we got, God says, okay, you're equipped. You're ready. I'm going to do something that I believe God asked me to do. I said, Karen, I need you. I'm going to anoint and impart to each one who feels God is calling them. In this move in these last days. If that's you, I want you to stand. And I'm going to have Pastor Karen go around and just anoint you because we're going to do an impartation this morning. I believe God wants to, you know, I call it the starting gate. You ever see those horse races when the gate opens? Well, this is the gate opening. But we need to do this. And, and, and God is very, very, like this church is a hub of hope. The hope is the assured hope that we carry. And God says, you know, you need to give it out. By the way, the gifts are not for you. 
and for somebody else. Amen? So I'm going to have Pastor Karen. She's going to anoint everybody that would like to like to do this and to, to impact the life of someone who is looking for hope. Somebody is looking for you. You got to be that light in a dark place. Now, I'm going to say this. Be aware. Because God's going to put people in your pathway. He's going to do it. Have a little bit of discernment just to know hey, this, this might be somebody God just sent to me. I think I'll lay a little hope on them. Amen? That's how it's going to be. I want to ask you to make it a matter of prayer that he'll not only guide you, but show you what to say and what to do when you encounter somebody that is hopeless. Amen? This is a heavy thing we're doing today. Brother Carl says this morning to me, he says, I feel God's going to do something today. I do. I think he's about to do it. Amen? So as she's anointing you, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your prophetic word, Lord, how you speak to us. Now you tell us the things that have to happen and have to be. But, Lord, most of all, we just thank you because you are our living hope. You are our assured hope, our definite, guaranteed hope. We don't have to fall into the things of the world and worry about this and worry about that because we have you as our hope and our light. Father, as we anoint these people today, we impart that hope to go out and to start using it and sharing it with the lost out there. Lord, that this town would absolutely be shaken and that you would just put those people in our pathways that you are calling today. Strengthen each one, Father, as we go out. Give us protection because we know the enemy does not want this to happen. We wear that helmet so that he cannot attack us. That helmet of faith. Father, I just pray a blessing over each one. Let us activate that today, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we'll give you the praise and glory and honor that you so richly deserve. We're thankful, Father, for living in these times. You have placed us at this time for a reason. And we'll give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.